you know, man, your dreams have to be bigger than all your fears. If you get, see, that's why you have to have big dreams. Because your dreams have to be bigger than all your fears and all your consequences. What makes people go back is you dream too small. See, your problem in life ain't if you aim too high and you miss it. Your problem in life is if you aim too low and you hit it. That's, you messed up now. So when you aim to the moon and you miss, you still amongst the stars. Be challenging my faith to act on my instincts. How do I overcome? Well, let me say this. I, let me just speak for myself. I have never had faith without it being surrounded by fear. The notion that you either have one or the other destroys the very definition of faith itself. Because faith springs out of the ground and the fertility of fear. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Now, now if, if there were no fear, there would be no need for faith. Let, let, let me show it to you real plain. When the children of Israel got ready to go down into the Red Sea and God made the water stand up on the right and the left, we talk about the faith that they went down into the dry bed with, but we don't talk about the fear. But imagine walls of water 40 feet high and you got your children walking through walls of water that could collapse at any moment. You don't think there was no fear? The real art to life is not to be controlled by the feeling of fear, but to let faith drive the wheel, even if fear is sitting in the back seat. Y'all yeah. don't hear what I'm saying to you. Yeah, be because you cannot count on fear to get out of the car in order for you to be mobile. You just don't want fear to drive the car. You want your faith to drive the car. And just because you have, the, even though you acknowledge the fact that you have a feeling that wants to drive called fear, it's up to you not to turn your car keys over to your fears and be driven by fear. You want to be driven by faith. So, so if I, I want to encourage you to read Hebrews 11. By faith, Abel offered up a more excellent sacrifice in Cain. Cain. By faith. Noah built an ark to the saving of his house. By faith, Enoch walked with God and was not. How did they do it? By faith. That doesn't mean that they didn't have fear, they didn't have problems, they didn't have opposition, they didn't have insecurity. If you're waiting for a clear path before you walk, you don't need faith. You need faith because you're facing fearful times. You understand? Though he slay me, Yet shall I trust him. See, see, see the paradoxical dilemma of faith, how faith is flourishing in an adverse atmosphere. Now, you, you, you as an act of your will have to decide what's going to drive your next move. I'll take another question. The bishop, how do I stay? Do I stay? Do I stay? When people know better, they do better. But over the years of my life, I wonder, is it true? When people know better, they do better. I can't even say that's always true in my own life. I know I should get up every morning early and exercise about 5.30 and jog about three miles. I know better. I know what is healthy, what is not healthy. I have been informed. I know how to bench press. I know how to do lat pull down. I know the form. I know what I ought to be doing. It is not the absence of knowledge, but the gulf between what we know and what we do is often a wide gulf and we don't always reach across. We're all participating in this thing called life. All of us. Life has ebb and flows. It's got thunderstorms in it, earthquakes. This life, stop expecting it to go smooth because it ain't finna go smooth. The road to success is always under construction. You combat negativity and you combat discouragement with gratitude. What messes you up is you focus on the thing that's not happening. So whenever you get discouraged, change your focus from what's not happening to what has happened. Because what causes the downslide is if you get wrapped up into what ain't happening, it get ugly, man. But you have to focus on gratitude. People understand how serious gratitude is. It's hard to be miserable and grateful at the same time. What are the things that you fear that's been keeping you from living your dream? That's been keeping you from doing some things that you would like to do? Life is about growth. You can either go back to your comfort zone 
and there you won't find any growth. Or you must be willing to go forward and face your fears because you're never going to have a fear-free existence. I mean, some fear is acceptable. There are some things that you, you really should be afraid of. Now, you shouldn't allow it to immobilize you. You take it into account and you carry yourself accordingly. It's the difference between having a fear and the fear having you. Being stopped by fear. It's perfectly fine to have some fears. You embrace those fears and then you move on. You act on whatever it is that you fear. What you resist will persist. It's good to pray. It's good to ask for God's help. But at some point, we all have to do like Peter. Say, God, I've honored you. I've prayed, I've believed, I've done my best. Now, God, I'm going to rest. I'm not going to worry about the medical report. I'm not going to live stressed out over the situation at work. I'm not going to be upset because I don't see anything happening. God, I trust you. If Peter would have been stressed, worried, maybe the angel wouldn't have showed up. Maybe he wouldn't have been free. But when God saw him resting, God said, all right, let me go to work. I wonder if you would see situations turn around if you'd simply come back to a place of peace. Worry doesn't make anything better. Being frustrated doesn't get God's attention. Begging God, reminding Him what's wrong, that only makes us depressed. Take the problem off the throne and put God back up on the throne. If you're talking more about your problem than you are about God, you have the wrong thing on the throne. I saw a saying the other day, it said, Dear problem, my God is so much bigger than you. But even in prayer, instead of praying in faith, sometimes we complain about what we don't like. God, these people at work, they get on my nerves. You better do something. God, my back's been hurting for six years. God, these prices are so high, I need your help. Instead of begging God, instead of reminding Him of everything that's wrong, why don't you try a different approach? Do like Peter. Go to sleep. Enter into His rest. Sometimes when I pray, I say, God, you already know what I need. You already know what I want. You know all about me. So, Lord, I just want to tell you that I love you, I trust you, and I thank you for getting me to where I'm supposed to be. Not begging God, but praying from a place of rest. Talking to Him from a place of peace. Our actions speak louder than our words. When you can sleep soundly, like Peter, in a time of great need, you're showing God that you trust Him. You're saying, God, I know you're bigger than this problem. You said you would never sleep, so I'm going to go to sleep. Even though things aren't perfect in my life, I'm going to relax knowing that you're on the throne and you are fighting my battle. It's a very freeing way to live. My message to you today is very simple. Go to sleep. Enter into his rest. Quit worrying about everything. Quit trying to figure it out. Turn it over to God. I see six people already asleep. Jesus said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Sheep are very calm, peaceful animals. They don't get upset. I've never seen a sheep having a nervous breakdown. Never seen one pacing the fields, stressed out, uptight. They're always at ease. Last summer, Victoria and I went to Colorado. And we were riding four-wheelers up in the mountains. We came around a corner. There were about 300 sheep in our path. We couldn't get by. I thought the equipment would scare them off, but they didn't move. I put my four-wheeler in neutral and I revved the engine real loud two or three times. Those sheep just looked at me like, why are you making all that racket? No more affected them. What's interesting is sheep are basically defenseless animals. They can't run fast. They don't have sharp teeth. They can't really kick. They rely on the shepherd to take care of them. The shepherd keeps them from danger. The shepherd protects them from wild animals. The shepherd tells them where to go. They don't worry. They know as long as they're with the shepherd, everything will be fine. We can take a lesson from the sheep. Stay in peace. The good shepherd is watching over you. The God who knew you before you were born, the God who breathed life into you, he's guiding you. He's protecting you. And yes, there will be some wolves in our path, some attacks, things we don't understand. Don't fall apart. Don't start complaining. Be like a sheep. Stay in peace. You don't have to run. You don't have to get all worked up. The good shepherd will fight your battles. He will lead you into green pastures. He'll restore your soul. You may go through some valleys, difficult seasons. You don't have to fear any evil for the Lord your God. The good shepherd is right there with you. But sometimes the reason we're not seeing God work in our life is we're not acting like sheep. We're worrying, living stressed out, trying to change things that we can't change. Why don't you come back to a place of peace? Come back to the still waters. 
You've worried about that problem long enough. Let your mind take a break. Some people never let their mind rest. They go on vacation for their body, but their mind is still worrying. They worry on the beach just like they worry at home. That doesn't help us to move one inch forward. In the scripture, when God told Ananias to go pray for Saul, Ananias didn't want to go. Saul was having believers arrested and put in prison. He was the greatest enemy of the church. But on the road to Damascus, when that light shined down bright, he became blind, a voice boomed out and said, Saul, why do you persecute me? He said, who are you? The voice said, I am Jesus. That moment was a turning point in Saul's life. He left there a changed man, but Ananias didn't know anything about what had happened on the road to Damascus. He still thought Saul was a huge threat. He said, Lord, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he's caused. Ananias was worried. He came up with a lot of reasons why he shouldn't pray for Saul. I'm sure he spent some restless nights thinking, I must not have heard God right. This man is dangerous. He didn't realize he was worried about something that God had already taken care of. He didn't know that Saul had already had a change of heart on the road to Damascus. When he finally went to pray for him, he found out that Saul was an ally instead of an enemy. Some of the things you're worried about, just like with Ananias, you can't see it yet, but God has already changed it. He's already spoken to the right people. He's already lined up your healing. He's already arranged that breakthrough. It's just a matter of time before you walk into it. No use losing sleep over that child that's off course anymore. No use being frustrated over that negative medical report, over that situation at work. The threat has already been canceled. The solution is already en route. Stay in peace and like Ananias, you'll come in to what God has already done. Friends, don't let worry rob you. If a thief came into your home every week and took your groceries, took your clothing, stole your furniture, it wouldn't take long at all before you got fed up and say, no more, that's enough. You'd put a stop to it real quickly. That's what you have to do with worry. Don't go another five years letting worry rob you of your joy, rob you of your peace. Put your foot down and say, that's it. This is a new day. No more worrying for me. I'm going to guard my mind. I'm going to stay by the still waters. I'm going to live from a place of peace. Remember, when you rest, God goes to work. But when you work, God rests. Whatever's bothering you, whatever you're tempted to worry about, I'm asking you to take that off the throne and put God back up on the throne. Make Him bigger. Use that same energy to thank Him that He's working in your life. Matter how fruitful you are somewhere in your life, you are either being attacked or about to be attacked some area of your life and God says I am going to bless you but you are got to dress for the battle while uh, you receive the blessing with uh, every blessing there is a battle. I would want trying to say that greater blessing the greater the battle. The enemy would not send that level of battle against you if we are not uh, that level blessing. You that level of battle you face is an inclination of the level of blessing that you. Uh, you stand to receive no roof or no roofs and empty house. Nobody holds up a bag lady because they, she does not have anything to settle in. Up under attack there's something to be uh, gained. See you got all dress up not to run. Uh, you got dress up to stand. Not to give place or Terrorists not to evaluate the trough that you you must learn to handle the negativity. Don't ignore I handle it. You don't have to live in it. You don't have to dwell on it. But you don't have to handle it. My opinion, I know. Some people teach just turn your head real quick. There is there is no way 
there is no way wheels they will take you granite so you have got handled to negativity